Hey, Patrice. Thanks for joining us today. I don't great. Doing good. I uh, wanted to kind of get circle back, and if you could just, just ex explain how your rehab process has gone, and then the the challenges uh, that came along with having to leave campus back in March, and, and how that maybe affected your your rehab. Uh, so I mean, looking back, rehab's been going pretty well since I mean since the time I got hurt and after surgery. Um, got a plan with the medical staff and I've been attacking it for the past couple months now, um, each and every day, just doing stuff, working. Um, if you ask some of the guys, you know, they could probably see me in the training room for about four hours throughout the day, um, in and out. I go to class, run back when I get a little bit of time off, get back to the training room, get some re rehab in, go to meetings. Once meetings are over, come back out, go to rehab. So I've been really attacking it um, a lot and, you know, just trying to keep pushing, make sure I'm getting back right. So once that whole uh, COVID-19 hit um, and I had to go, leave, go back home. Um, that was a little bit challenging at first, um, just trying to figure out, you know, how to maneuver and how to just keep attacking my rehab with the same intensity and the same, you know, um, consistency as I did, you know, once I was on campus. So, um, but thankfully enough, uh, with the help of our, our, our training staff and, you know, our trainers and our doctors, they were able to come up with a plan for me um, to do at home. So I was doing that and Coach Hess as well. Um, he, he did a really good job in helping me, in, you know, uh, designing a plan. Uh, for me so I was able to go home and you know still attack like I said still have the same um consistency still have the same you know um mindset with my rehab uh but once you know things in the country I mean back home in Canada started you know um unfolding and realized that things were going to be close for a longer period of time than expected and I want to be able to you know get actual physical attention by a doctor or my physiotherapist from home that's when I realized that um I should probably explore the idea or try to come back to campus and you know get back to you know, where I have more res access to more resources. Um, so once we established that, um, talked to Coach Brown about it, and, you know, we talked and he, he agreed and he, 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 was, he was all for it and he supported me. And, you know, we, we kind of found ways, came together for me to get back into the country, um, talking to the embassy, you know, having the doctors write a letter, this and that. Um, but ultimately it was done and they approved me coming back in and I was allowed to travel. And I've been back home for about three to four weeks now, um, continuing with my rehab and getting right. So, um, it was a little challenging, a little bump in the road, but now I'm back and, you know, just attacking full force again. Anything further, Greg? Yes. Uh, I guess it was Coach Brown had mentioned that, that when you got home to Canada, uh, yeah. the facility you had planned to work out at and rehab had shut down. Yeah. So it sounds like that kind of spurred the decision to come back here. Yeah. Um, how, how are you set up now? Are you, are you able to – if you have a place where you can go? Uh, yeah do the workout and the rehabs so yeah obviously things are not back to normal 100 percent where you know, i have access to everything uh like like i usually would but um coming back here uh talking to coach Hess and the trainers we've been able to establish another plan where um thankfully i go to unc we're at this great university where you know they really take uh care of their athletes and you know they really invest in that and you know with uh they have this one uh, building stallings for uh the most of the injured athletes like especially the post-op athletes that you know need more care and you know attention physio are able to go in there um at certain times and work with the trainers, um, obviously following all the guidelines necessary and stuff like that. But I'm still able to have that access um, with them and seeing them and training, uh, uh, training with them and doing what I have to do. And then with Coach Hess, he's just been um, really great in terms of giving me equipment, everything I need so I could have uh, a little like workout facility in my garage where I have to stay at right now. So um, he's giving me barbells, weights, everything that I need to do to kind of have that at home field gym. So um, the combination of both of those things, um, I just really feel, you know, grateful and blessed to be able to continue with the rehab and just keep pushing and uh, finish off strong. Great. Thank you. Good, Greg. Yep. All right, we'll go to Andrew Jones. Andrew, go ahead. Hey, Patrice, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And <clears throat> excuse me, I hope you're doing well. Um, the embassy thing, that, that's pretty interesting. Can you kind of take us through uh, how that played out and what you specifically had to do, whatever role you had to play in, in getting that taken care of? Yeah, um, so I mean, pretty much uh, ultimately the big thing was just uh, essential traveling. So they closed the borders between uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, for, you know, for uh, you can't just travel in and out of the country. Um, you have to have actual valid reason, whether that be your job or, you know, medical purposes and stuff like that. Um, so for me, uh, it was just a matter of showing or having enough, you know, evidence to show that I need it. it it's beneficial for me to come back. Um, so uh, in terms of Canada, they were fine with it in terms of me leaving because I wasn't staying. It was just more so on the American side to for them allowing me in there. 
Um, but once, you know, uh, I talked to them to see, let them explain to them that I'm a student athlete at Carolina. Um, you know, I'm on the football team. I just had surgery, uh, knee surgery, and, you know, it'd be beneficial for me to go out there and access the resources since everything's closed in Canada where I won't have be able to go to the doctors, be able to see my physiotherapist or, you know, have that type of, you know, um, a treatment. And then uh, we had the doctors over here, Dr. Shioka, he had written a letter to the embassy just explaining my situation, saying that he's the doctor he performing surgery and, you know, um, it'd be beneficial if he were able to go back and, you know, have a little bit more access to certain things so he could progress with his rehab. Um, and, you know, thankfully enough, the embassy was very understanding. They knew what I had to going on. Um, also, I kind of threw it in there uh, that, you know, I have a house where I'm paying rent. So um, it kind of be nice where I would be able to live where I'm paying rent at and not, you know, just have an empty home where I'm just wasting my money. So they kind of thought that was funny as well. And that kind of helped with that. But um, like I said, Coach Brown and everything, he was fully supportive. Uh, anything I needed or they were, had requested, uh, we got together and made that happen. And, and how long did it take from when you guys decided you were going to try to make that happen to where it actually did happen? And was it stressful for you during uh, any time in that process? Uh, the whole process, probably like a week uh, total. I mean, uh, once I realized, like, I was at home for a bit, and once I realized, like, things were actually getting serious, and, like, they said they had, like, they had put in an order that everything was going to be shut down until the end of June, like, officially. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, well, that's a little concerning, knowing that um, I probably won't have access for the next – that was, like, early. That was, like, it would have been, like, three months without, you know, access to anything. Um, so once we figured that out, um, I contacted the MC the first time. They had told me what I had needed to do and kind of gather up the information I needed. So once I, I, I got that from them, um, I was able to come report back to the coaches and, you know, with the guys, and they uh, they helped me out to get anything everything I needed, and I was able to bring that to the embassy, and then it kind of went smooth from there. Yeah. Thank you. Good, Andrew? Yeah, thanks, Patrice. Appreciate it. All right, we'll go to, to Luke Buxton. Luke, go ahead. What's up, Therese? What up, Luke? Um, it's been a while since we kind of last talked about your injury um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of want to learn uh, what have you been going on this process in terms of in personal growth? What have you learned about yourself? Um, any advice that you took away from that talk and then advice that you pass on now that you're kind of on the exit stage coming out of the recovery? Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, uh, this whole process since the time I got hurt to surgery, um, it's been very eye opening um, in terms of, you know, finding myself and, you know, digging deep down inside of me and knowing, you know, um, who I really am and, and one thing really that I realized is just how much I love the game of football um, and how much, you know, it means to me being away from it for so long. Like I could tell you, I'm, I'm probably one of the guys that's most excited to be able to step back in Keenan and go out there and play. Um, so I really realized that that's something that I really want to do. I really want to pursue. And this is my dream. So um, I've just found more love for the game. Um, and uh, it's just been, you know, a, a tough process, but the type of person I am, worth ethic, hard work, I think has been instilled in me in a very young age. So I kind of took it as I accepted what happened and now it's just, you know, how I attack it and just try to get better and get to where I was at. Um, so uh, for advice, I mean, just finding myself in terms of knowing that I just love the game and finding a deeper love for the game of football since I've been away from it. And uh, in terms of advice from adversity, like to give out to people, is just um, you're going to go through adversity. You're going to go find, you know, some some bumps in the road, but you just got to you know, deal with it and just start attacking it and have a positive mindset where you can't do anything about the wrong and you just got to control what you can't control. And that's your attitude, um, how you attack it, your effort that you give and your, you know, your vision and enthusiasm. So if you can control these things, you'll probably end up uh, on the better side of things. Anything further, Luke? Yeah, just going off that and talk about the love, love for the game. Were there ever days where that love kind of disappeared and you're like because you were in the midst of just so much rehab and it seemed so far away or? um nah because for me uh it kind of became I guess you could say like an addicting factor like working like I mean I loved work like uh I, I, working out like work, like grinding like practice like I, I love doing that type of thing so once you're involved in it and I was invested in like the rehab I was just like all right there's just there's not enough rehab I can do like I was just addicted to it I was like I said I was always in the training room for four to five hours a day I just couldn't get enough of it so um that's like been the mindset of, of me and then I have a vision at the end of the tunnel that I'm trying to achieve you know and it's just I see it getting closer and closer as much as I'm working as much as I'm working so um that really what kept me motivated kept me pushing um and you know just knowing that I'm I will be able to you know fully recover and get back to doing what I love is playing the game of football um that was able to kind of keep my spirits up and keep me going. So I don't think really I had a day where I was like, man, like obviously there were hard days, but the fact that there was a bigger picture and there was an end goal that just kept me pushing each and every day.
for sure. Thanks, Reese. Thanks, Luke. Uh, we'll go to Jared. Jared, you're up. Patrice, how are you doing? Uh, I know that this subject might be a bit sensitive, so if you don't care to elaborate on it, I fully understand. But I saw on social media a number of weeks back mm -hmm. where you posted that you lost a relative to COVID-19. And yeah. I was just wondering if you might be able to share your family's experience, because it's very different than a lot of us yeah. during this time of the pandemic. Yeah, so um, what happened was um, one of my uncles, so my, uh, my dad's sister, um, her husband, uh, my uncle, so my, my second uncle, he, he passed, he had got sick in New York. So in New York's kind of been a prominent spot for the COVID where it's, it's been, uh, they had high, high levels of, of, you know, positive tests and stuff like that. So um, he had gotten sick uh, and really didn't really tell anybody at the time. Um, you know, we just thought, well, the family just thought that he was, you know, kind of just sick and he didn't really, really express how he was feeling until things got a little worse, had to get to the hospital and then, Eventually he did um, test positive for it and then try to go through the treatment and ended up not making it. But um, for us as a family, it was just really hard because um, we are a big family and we're very close. Um, my family, like it means the world to me, they mean the world to me. And um, we are have a really good relationship. And the fact that we weren't able to physically be there for my aunt, I wasn't able to physically be there for my cousin cousins. That was really what was hard for us. Um, and to have you know my aunt go through the whole process by herself, um, and she, like my dad and their family, they're nine, I think nine brothers and sisters. I mean, they're all kind of spread out throughout the States. And I mean, obviously my dad's in Canada and all the other siblings are spread out. So just not being able to physically be there for one another was very hard for us and challenging. But I mean, it just opens your eyes, makes you realize, you know, how important and precious, you know, time is with the family. And, you know, don't always think, take things for granted. Um, and it's, a, it's very unfortunate, but I mean, we can't really, do much about it, but just understand uh, that it's a serious time and these things are serious and things like that do happen and just not to take anything for granted. But um, we, we've, we've been able to, you know, move on. And I, I talk to my cousins each and every day. We FaceTime, we have a little group chat. Um, just make sure I'm just there for there for more support. Um, you know, just doing everything I can to help them get through this time. Um, but, you know, just not being able to physically be there has been hard and having the funeral through Zoom and this and that um, was kind of challenging. But um, we're getting, we're going through it, and we're a family of faith, and you know we know that God's in our corner. So um, we've been relying on Him a lot too to help us out. As there is a contention of people who are pushing maybe heavily to reopen the country, do you are your feelings a bit more on the stronger side of hey, safety first in that regards now? Um, definitely op opened my eyes to you know the the severity of the situation. Um, obviously, um, not taking it lightly, but. Uh, I just, you know, feel like our, our representatives and our, our, all the health uh, officials are kind of, you know, they know what to do and I kind of trust them into kind of, you know, making those decisions. Um, whatever happens, happens. You know, I can't control if the country's opening. I would love for it to, you know, um, get back to normal as soon as we can. But if it's not safe or if it's not, you know, the right time, then I don't feel like we should push anything. So, um, you know, I'm just, as everybody else, just waiting back, seeing how, how things go. Thank you for sharing that, Patrice. I do greatly appreciate that. I know that's tough. Yeah, Thank no. you. Thanks, Jared. Go to, to Ross Martin. Ross, go ahead. Hey, Patrice. Uh, yeah, kind of getting to the UNC team here. Um, what, can you, what can we expect from the two transfer corners, Bryce Watts and Kyle McMichael? What do they bring? And what do you kind of see from them from your time? observing and, and, and I guess practicing with him a little bit at the beginning of the 2019 season. Um, yeah, um, I'm, we're really excited to have those, uh, both those guys being eligible to play and, you know, coming, being really fully a part of the team now. Um, they, they bring a lot of great things to, 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 the, to the table. Um, uh, one thing that pops straight out of my head is the speed. Both of those guys are really, really fast, especially Bryce. He's a, he's a really fast guy that can run with receivers. Um, Kyler, he's very fast and physical as well. Um, so, I mean, it, it'll be exciting uh, to have them, you know, on board and, and you know, seeing. And ultimately, it just brings out the, the competition level. Um, it just adds more competition to the, to the room, to the DB room. Um, will push us to, you know, kind of go hard at practice, you know, just compete with one another. So I'm very excited for that. But um, they're very, very both talented players and, you know, um, with great skill sets. And I think that'll help us out win a lot of games. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, how does it feel kind of having more depth? at cornerback with, with you coming back and, and obviously the addition of two corners and the experience of Storm Duck and players like that. And how would you approach this group heading in? Uh, I mean, I feel very confident. And with us having more depth, it just allows us to be more comfortable, comfortable and allows Coach Bateman, you know, to be 
uh, a lot more diverse in what he wants to do, um, you know, and he could, you know, just really fully invest himself in the defense and kind of, you know, put all of our, um, you know, all the, all, all the weapons that we have on the field, you know, just having that depth just allows us to just be more versatile. Um, and uh, for me personally, it just allows me to probably rest a little bit more. don't have to play 80, 90 snaps, um, knowing that we won't have any fall off from the ones that um, I feel like, you know, in the DB room, we're very, very, very deep in depth. And we have a lot of guys that have a lot of talent, like you mentioned, um, Storm, Kyler, um, a lot of young guys that have taken these reps last year that were able to get on the field and have that experience and bringing that into uh, next year. So I feel like we're just, it's, it's just, it's, it's all positive to have depth. Depth is always good. Depth is always a friend. And just being able to not have that drop off between the ones and the twos is just very beneficial for us. Thank you. Good, Roth. Yep. All right, we'll go to Gregory Hall. Gregory, go ahead. Hey, Patrice. What was it like for you having to sit on the sidelines during while you were injured last season? Um, obviously, the hype, Mac brought that back, and you weren't able to be a part of that after being injured. What was that like for you? Um, it was very tough. It was very tough. Um, I mean, like I said, uh, I love the game of football, and, and, and I realized that, you know, I've been playing this game for years and years since I was about six years old, and it's always been a part of my life. And not being able to participate in the game that you love, that you've been playing and that you've been training for, um, it, it is tough. But uh, at the end of the day, I came at peace with it. And I kind of, instead of kind of sitting back and sulking, I kind of took a different mindset of, all right, now I just got to still be a part of the team. And, and by doing that, I'm talking about, you know, being supportive, cheering on my teammates, holding the guys accountable, um, making sure, you know, they're doing the right things, um, helping the younger guys out uh, if they have questions and stuff like that. So just trying to help the team out as much as I can. So just being on the sideline, it was tough not being able to, able to play, but it was still nice to see the guys, you know, experience some success, you know, seeing how far we've come as a team and seeing what Coach Mack has done with the team. It's just, um, I mean, I can't, I can't do anything to be happy and seeing the guys, the receivers, you know, seeing Chaz, for example, my one of my best friends, college roommates, seeing the season he had, I was just very happy and ecstatic for him. So um, just encouraging all the guys to keep pushing this and that. Um, but also oftentimes when we were having difficulties, um, it was hard. I wish I was able to kind of get on the field and kind of help and kind of give my talents and, you know, especially on the back side, uh, back end of things and secondary when we'd have plays that probably didn't go our way. I would be like, damn, like if I was on the field, maybe that wouldn't happen. We probably would have won some games, um, this and that. But uh, it, it's been hard. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm still I had to support my team, make sure we're heading in the right direction and just trying to help as best as I could. And then how do you expect the, uh, I guess, improved depth that you guys are going to have going into this year to make you better? And then what are the benefits for just having depth in general? Yeah, in terms of me making me better, it's just ultimately just competition. Now, you know, it's a lot of guys. And in the day, this is a business and it's like, it is what it is. Like you have the best man, the best player will get on the field and play. You know what I mean? So uh, in terms of having depth in that sense, it just brings out the competition out of guys. And, you know, um, we just want to compete and get better and better and better. So I feel like that'll push me and motivate me to, you know, make sure that I'm on my, on my P's and Q's and not letting the team down. And that, that'll do the same for them. If they see me going hard, they'll know to go hard as well. So that competition level will definitely elevate and, you know, bring out the best of us. Um, and like I said earlier, just in terms of having depth, it just allows you to just be more comfortable in terms of the defense and what you want to do, knowing that you won't have any drop offs or knowing that, you know, you could save a little guys in terms of fatigueness and save their energy a little bit and kind of dis uh, disperse the, you know, look workload. Um, so I feel like it's just beneficial overall. Hey, Gregory. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go to Pat. Pat, go ahead. Hey, Patrice. Um, Coach Bly was talking the other day about how when he first got hired that uh, leadership was something that he really kind of emphasized with you. Just kind of how much did you kind of take that to heart um, when he told you that? And just kind of how much did you kind of try to work on that throughout last season while you were sidelined? Yeah, I mean, leadership is definitely something that I've been trying to, you know, push for throughout my career. I'm always been a guy that's been seen as a leader of the team or leader of the group. Um, and, you know, f luckily for me, when I was a freshman in college, when I came to Carolina, I had a lot of great leaders ahead of me with MJ Stewart, um, Des Lawrence, you know, um, we had uh, JK Britt, Donnie Miles. So a lot of great leaders that were in that room when I was a freshman, I was able to learn from them and see how they went about things and kind of, you know, that uh, inspired me a lot. And Coach Bly, come, him coming in, um, I've kind of been the older guy. I've experienced a lot during my time in Carolina, having four different coaches. 
Um, so he kind of leaned on me being one of the older guys to kind of, you know, get, connect with the guys that we have um, in the room right now and kind of, you know, help him out with certain things. So um, it's definitely a title that I'm proud to hold and I'm very, you know, comfortable with and just helping the guys just ultimately get better. That's that's the whole point. Um, just helping the team get better, helping the guys get better and um, just knowing, um, telling them, letting them know what they need to do do what I've learned, um, my experiences, um, certain advice that I can do. So anything I could do to help my teammates get better, I'm doing um, anything, whether that's, you know, telling them, oh, you probably shouldn't stay out that out that night or you probably should go to sleep earlier or you should do this on your break or that. Just anything I could offer them to help them get better, I feel like um, I'm doing. And that's really what part of being a leader is, is making those around you better as well as yourself. You, uh, you talked about, you know, the four DB coaches and everything. You've been pretty open just about all the adversity that you've kind of faced throughout your career. Um, obviously the ACL was kind of a different sort of adversity than you'd face, but when that happened, just kind of all the things that you've been through before, how'd that kind of maybe kind of help you as you went through your rehab, just kind of that resilience that you had? Yeah, like I said, um, you know, throughout life, you're going to encounter some obstacles, you're going to encounter some bumps in the road, and that's what makes you stronger. Um, you know, Coach Fedora, uh, he used to always say adversity's coming. Adversity is coming. He used to always mention adversity is always coming. It's just whether you're going to let it, you know, affect you or you're going to grab it by the throat and choke it, you know. So that's kind of like the mindset I've always had. Um, I know adversity is coming. I won't, I'm not surprised when it comes. I'm not shocked. It's just a matter of how you bounce back. So um, throughout my, you know, my whole college career, everything I've went through, it's always made me stronger to be able to attack the neck obstacle. So um, that's kind of been my mindset throughout the whole process. Good, Pat. Thank you. All right, back to Andrew. Andrew, go ahead. Hey, Patrice, I apologize if I missed this, but how healthy are you right now? Close to 100% at 100%? Yeah, I'm right. I'm, I'm on the back end of the, the rehab process, so um, I'm fully expected to be fully cleared within the next month, um, kind of by the time we get back. So that was kind of the timetable um, before, you know, before the whole COVID happened. It was uh, to be fully cleared throughout summer workouts. So, and I actually just saw the doctor today. Matter of fact, this morning, um, I had my uh, check-in with him and everything looks good. Um, and now it's just a matter of, I'm about 90%. It's just the last 10%, just fine tuning things within the next month, just making sure, um, you know, I'm able to, you know, sustain, like change the direction that's unexpected and stuff like that. So um, I'm in the back end of the process, uh, getting ready to be fully back uh, about, about within a month from now, yeah. Did the time away because of the the virus shutdown, did that kind of slow this process? Would you might be maybe be 100% now if that didn't occur? Or was the kind of end date always about sometime in June? No, it was always about some time in June. With ACL surgeries, they always say it's about nine months recovery. So um, I had surgery in late September, early, uh, like September 27th it was. So kind of like that timetable has always been the same. Um, and like I said before, with the help of the coaching staff, Coach Hess and Luke, our, our trainer, that time away with the COVID, I was still able, it wasn't like I was home just sitting on my butt, you know, I was able to keep working and keep pushing. And um, they've done a really good job and I'm very grateful for that. And we've been managed to, you know, keep that timetable moving the right way. So everything's going according to plan, everything's going good. Um, thanks to God and I, you know, I'm, I'm we're with the process right now. Cool, thanks, appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. All right, we're back to, to Greg Barnes. Greg, go ahead. Trey, just wanted to get your insight on, on two different individuals. The, the first is uh, Coach Bly, as you said, you know, this is your fourth position coach here. Uh, if there was a criticism or concern about Dre coming in, is that he had not coached at this level, mm -hmm. to do athletically and at the position. Um, what's your take on how he kind of developed and emerged and, and sharing his, his skill set with the players in, in a coaching manner? Yeah. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Coach Bly is um, Coach Bly has been around as long as I've been around, you know, um, since I, when I was a freshman, he was always around. He used to come out to games, be on the sidelines, um, talk to us, give me advice. So I've known Coach Bly for a while now and he's known me for a while. So having that, he's always been a familiar face in that sense. Um, and he used to always give me advice. I used to always go to him and ask for him for advice as well. So um, having him as a coach now is like, oh, it's a familiar face that I know and I respect and I know what he's done and a lot of people know what he's done. He has a great resume and, you know, he has the credentials, you know, to, 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 to have the job. And I, it was a, once I heard he was getting hired, I was very ecstatic and I couldn't wait to learn from him because he, he knows a whole bunch of stuff and I couldn't wait to pick his brain apart. Um, once he got there, obviously he hasn't coached on that level before, but I think he's done a really good job and, you know, his role, I think he understands his roles too on the team. Um, he's our corners coach and, he, he does a really, really, got, really good job at that, coaching us in terms of technique, um, how to do things, scheme. And I think Coach Bateman, him 
being the mastermind of his, uh, he kind of, you know, takes care of all the scheme schematics and, you know, all that type of thing. But Coach Bly, he's really just a corner guru. Like he knows everything about the position and has elevated my game so much for just a short amount of time he's been with me. Um, but him, him himself, he's been learning. Um, you can tell he's taking great strides in terms of, you know, learning schemes and stuff like that and kind of being more of a, you know, football coach oriented in terms of defense in general, not just only at the corner position. And he's just been doing really good. But with us, um, he, help, he helps us each and every day kind of fine tune our skills as corners and making us sure that when we're ready on Saturdays, we're able to go out there and make plays. And then also wanted to ask about Storm Duck. Uh, you were thrown into the action as a freshman uh, on a very big stage. Uh, that was a learning curve for you. Storm kind of had the same situation with so many injuries uh, at cornerback for you guys last year. Can you just kind of speak to his mindset and how you saw him develop last year? Yeah, Storm, Storm's a, a great guy, interesting guy. Um, I always say he's too cool for school. Um, he's very uh, mellow guy, you know, always easygoing, doesn't, you know, really have – you know, that, that much expression, you know, you won't really see him too high or ever too low. He's always just mellow. And I think he's done a really good job. Um, one thing about Storm, he's very, very open to hit listening. Um, he takes, he takes advice very well. I mean, he's come to me a couple of times, asked me for things and I've told him, given him some advice and he's, he's very, very coachable. And that's, I think that's why he's had a lot of the success that he had this season as a freshman, uh, just being coachable and being able to, you know, willing to listen to what we tell him, um, the advice that we give him and just putting that an action on the field. Um, but, you know, Storm, he's a very, very strong kid, very smart kid as well, um, works really hard. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, how, how his career continues. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised at the success that he had and, you know, how he was able to play. Um, he's, he's just really, really just a great kid. And, you know, I'm glad that he's, he's in a part of our room. Thanks, for Patrice. Yeah. Luke, go ahead. Um, so I asked coach, your coach, Coach Bly, this on Monday. I want to get your thoughts on it, on the new NIL policy um, that came out about a couple weeks ago. Is there any talk with your teammates about it? Has there been any thought um, with yourself about how might this impact you? Just kind of want to hear what's said, going on that team. The name image it. like this, NIL. Oh, okay. Image like this. Yeah, um, I think for us, I, 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 from what I've read, I think it will take – all this stuff that will uh, actually be put in place by the time I'm done. So after the season, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, I'm not sure. That's correct. Uh, different uh, suggestions and stuff like that. But I think the rules will actually be impl implemented once, you know, I'll be gone after the season. So I haven't really thought about it um, as much in terms of personally. I mean, I wish – uh, I think definitely is a good thing for the game and for the sport and, you know, for athletes to be able to kind of, you know, um, help their families out, help themselves out based on, you know, their name and likeness and stuff like that. And I definitely wish I was able to kind of benefit from 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 the, having that opportunity. But um, uh, not doing the so I haven't really thought about it or thought, you know, really I'm just going to fall back and see how it goes. But I'm definitely for it and I'm excited to see how it goes and how it helps out the guys coming in, in the future. Has there been any talk with your teammates like when it got released, or is it kind of just like when it takes them when it gets put in place, we'll we'll deal with it then? Um, it's a great. I mean, it's it, it's we definitely talked about like it's a step in the right direction. We believe and we're excited, but I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen or how they're really going to do it. Um, we've had certain meetings. I remember throughout the year where Bubba would come in and he kind of explained to us what the NCAA was thinking and how they were thinking of probably doing things, and he was asking for our input. Um, so we've had those type of talks, but um, in terms of you know. Um, seeing we we could only see what happens. We we can't we don't really have that that you know power to make any decisions ourselves. So we're just able to kind of sit sit back and see where they go with it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, man. Good Luke. Yep. All right. We're going back to Gregory. Gregory, go ahead. Patrice, what are some of your goals for the uh, 2020 season? Uh, some of my goals. So personal goals. Um, definitely to you know. Main, my, my main goal right now is to get as healthy as I could possibly be before the season starts. Um, that's what I'm taking my full energy in is, you know, by the time camp starts, is to be fully 100%. Um, but once, you know, I'm back on it, uh, my goals for any, uh, this season is to make the first team all ACC. I really want that as a corner. Um, and, you know, just help my team win as much as as many games as possible. As a team, our goal is just to win every game in the state, um, win the Coastal, and then head to the championship game and win the last game. So, um, 
just be be champions. That's that's the ultimate goal we want to do is is to be champions and win games. Um, but me personally, I just will definitely want to be a first team All ACC in my in my position and you know establish myself as a dominant presence in the league and as a team just to win as many games as possible. What do you need to do to accomplish that? And then what do you guys need to do as a secondary to help get your team to the ACC championship game? Uh, for me personally, it's just, you know, fine tune my skills, just continue to get better and just continue to learn and kind of understand the game a little bit better. Um, I mean, picking Coach Bateman's part, you know, as a senior right now, I think um, I've transitioned my part of the game to, you know, I also also work on the technical aspect of it, but just the second level, you know, scheme, schematics and understanding the game. I feel like that's where, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, evolving and just trying to take that step toward the next level. It's just kind of understanding why we're doing things why we're calling certain calls. Obviously, you know, the technical part of it is important, just knowing my footwork and stuff like that. But I feel like uh, the next steps I need to take is just on the mental side of it, just really understanding the game and the defense. So when I'm out there, I'm able to fly around even faster, understand what's going on. And I feel like that kind of, you know, spills into the secondary, you know, just knowing what we're doing, just being able to play fast, uh, making plays, getting creative turnovers, I think will definitely, definitely uh, be an emphasis for us to give the ball back to our offense. I think we have one of the most op explosive offenses in the country. Um, so just being able to give them the ball back as much as we can, um, doing our part of that thing will help us a lot and get us in a better position to get to the ACC championship and win it. Good, Gregory. Uh, one more question. And then do you think sitting out for a year helped you improve that mental aspect of the game and get you ready for what you need to do for this upcoming season? Oh, for sure. For sure. Just being able to be in meetings, you know, throughout the year while the season was going on, um, just being able to learn and, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to focus on. If I'm not physically able to participate in practice, I could take mental reps. Mental reps are very important, especially for a guy that's aspiring to go to the next level in the NFL. Um, the mental side of the game is very important. So um, like I like you mentioned, sitting out, that really gave me the opportunity to kind of, you know, really observe what's going on and really understand things. And um, like I mentioned, Coach Bateman, he is just such a mastermind. And just to have him as my DC is nothing could be better than that. And um, I think he's really great. And he's taught. Taught, taught me a lot. Um, I meet with him a lot and he has a lot of connections as well. And, you know, being able to watch NFL films, see how they do certain things, how he implements that to our defense. Um, it's just been very, very, very good. So uh, the mental side of it is definitely something that I've been working on and pushing and keep trying to improve on as well. Yep. All right, JB. Hey, you got me? Yep. Hey, Patrice, thanks so much for taking out time for us, man. We appreciate you for this. Uh, all of this talk about your rehab and uh, you being at 90% needing that last 10% kind of like sparked my interest as far as um, how much did this pandemic and having to, you know, have all these Zoom calls and do, do these Zoom workouts and things like that through online, how much did it affect your rehab process and how hard will it be for you to get to that 10% that you got to get to um, to become 100 percent through the through Zoom workouts or how, whatever means you're you're doing right now. Yeah, um, like I mentioned, it's just uh, just having a plan. Um, I think that's something we did really well. Is just have a plan and understanding what's going on and not just living up in the air. You know, it's just kind of sitting down, being concrete about it. All right, this is what's happening. This is what I can do. This is what I can't do. How we're going to maneuver around that. So, um, like I said, our, our strength coaches, our trainers. Um, my coaches, they've done a really good job to kind of make a plan and kind of maneuver through that plan. Um, and that last time, 10%, like I mentioned, like it's, it's, it's part of the rehab process. Like uh, that timetable that I had being cleared, you know, I was supposed to be cleared by the time camp came. So clear, clear by the time June, summer workouts, I'd be doing summer workouts with the team. Um, and then by the time camp came in August, I'd be full go. So um, it's just still, the timetable is still the same. Um, you know, we're still progressing like we would have regularly if this pandemic didn't happen. Um, so that's why I'm saying having that plan and having that structure is what has allowed me to, you know, progress as 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 I should, you know. Um, so that's that's continuing forward. Um, I think still having the same plan, the Zoom meetings, uh, we just have to adjust to it. But uh, I'm not really too worried about about anything, honestly. OK. Uh, I have one follow-up question to that as well. When you do get back to 100% and things do get back to normal and you guys are allowed to have um, on-campus trainings and all that or whatever, um, can, can you speak on the concern that will still be there in the back of your head knowing that this pandemic is kind of like going to be a cloud over 
everything, over sports, over everything going on right now. Can you speak about the, the, the concern that will be in the back of your head still dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of concern in terms, you know, of what's going to happen. Nobody really knows, and I feel like, you know, nobody can honestly say, oh, I know this is what's going to happen or what, when we're coming back or how we're going to do or how things are going to be, how is the life going to be after this whole pandemic. Um, so obviously there's concern there and, you know, kind of doubting like how things are going to be. But I think one thing that Coach Brown especially um, has done a good job with the team is just making sure we control what we can control. Um, so kind of the Zoom meetings um, in that sense, like having the guys, we're always meeting at least twice a week, um, making sure we're staying on top of the defense, knowing what we have to do, knowing our assignments. Um, Coach Hess doing the, uh, what he can with the guys, making sure their strength and conditioning is getting taken care of. Um, so going back to the whole idea of having a plan, like we've done a really good job, our coaches have done a really good job, and the people around us have done a really good job to build a plan for us to make sure we're able to keep improving and then not fall behind. So once that pandemic hits, once, uh, once the pandemic ends and we're back to normal, we're not, you know, oh, all right, what now? It's like, all right, let's just pick up where we left off. So um, we've been doing a really good job. And one thing, the guys are all all in. The guys have bought into it. The guys, um, I'm fortunate enough to have teammates that are very understanding and they know we all have a common goal. And in order for us to achieve those goals, this is what we have to do. So we have to be locked in um, in the Zoom meetings twice a week. We have to be locked into what Coach Hess sends us. Um, you know, we have to be accountable, making sure, all right, I got to go do those runs on my own. Like, because my teammate's doing it, I have to do it. So um, Coach Brown always, and he tells us that he keeps it real with us. You know, he says that once everything clears up and we're back, we're not slowing down for anything or anyone. So every guy understands that. And I feel like they, they've they accepted that and accepted that. And they're, they're working. So once we're back, it's just back where we left off. So we have no drop off, you know. Uh, that was so awesome, man. I see a future in media relations for you, kind sir. Thank you very much. He's got a face for TV. He'll be in front of the camera. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>